Hi there, I'm David Harvey. I'm here with John Andrews, and this is the Two Text Podcast. In this podcast, we're two friends, two different countries, here every two weeks talking about two different texts from the Bible. This is our second season. It's about the miracles of Jesus. And this is episode five, and it's called His Name Was Legion. Well, hello, John. We are uh, here again and ready for another two texts this week. And so let's jump straight into it. We're talking about Jesus and his miraculous uh, works that he's doing and what we might learn from that. And we have for the next two episodes, a really tasty chapter of Mark's gospel, which is Mark chapter five. So you're going to read it for us just now. Is that yeah, okay? Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, very excited about this. So here we go. Verse one, Mark five. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And we'll we'll leave it there because uh, that sets us up nicely for our next podcast, David. So there we are. Beautiful story. <laughs> also a slightly scary story. <laughs> when, when, when you actually think about what's going on there, I often wonder if Mark had a sort of side gig in writing scary stories for people. Because if you actually <laughs> listen to this, the images and the, and, and the picture that he paints, mm. it would be quite a scene, wouldn't it? There's hills and tombs. There's this man who is probably heavily scarred and damaged because of what he's been doing to himself. Is his encounter with Jesus. It's all done at loud volume. Then there's then there's pigs diving off <laughs> diving off the side of the cliff. You know, I mean it's 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 big budget movie stuff <laughs> if you were to try and turn this into a scene that we could understand. <laughs> For sure. And of course the disciples of Jesus 
are entirely Jewish and are entering into what will feel to them like a, a fairly unsafe region as well. I think the pigs are a great little touch on that in terms of letting the reader know we are now firmly in Gentile territory. So yeah. so imagine also yeah, then we're, we're layered not in on Kansas the, anymore, Dorothy. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So layered layered on to the obvious aggressive nature of this moment. And it's probably the most aggressive event we've seen in the Gospel of Mark up to this point in terms of in terms of this mm. experience. Um but then put it in the context we're also firmly in Gentile territory. And it makes for even the disciples of Jesus, it makes a very unnerving experience. And of course, one of the things that is remarkable as just a little almost throwaway is that the disciples aren't even referenced here. It's like <laughs> you, you do sort of get the impression they're going, oh, whoa, uh, step away from the man with the chains. And it's uh, and you do really. And of course, we, we've all been in those life moments that have terrified us slightly and put us on the back foot. But also some of us have been in maybe spiritual experiences that have really thrown us. We are, mm. whoa, what's just happened or what is happening? And we're disorientated. And it is quite striking. There's not a single reference to his his gorgeous young disciples in this story, probably taking yes. uh, a fairly significant back seat on this particular <laughs> event. <laughs> was, and who who would blame them? Who would blame them? Seriously, I was I was involved. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say involved, John. That would be uh, completely misleading. I I was present at an armed robbery once while I was doing some <laughs> some work in the U.S. I was in a gas station and and some men came in with guns and 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 held up the place and me and my friends in a scene that I would love to see the CCTV from realized that we had a very brief moment that we snuck out the back door <laughs> so we saw the people coming in realized what was going on and somewhere on CCTV in the world there's the three of us just shuffling along the wall and then out the door and <laughs> and we were gone never to know what exactly happened there again i i feel like that's the disciples <laughs> This story. Mm. Just let's yeah. go back to the boat, boys. <laughs> Indeed, and and it, of course, it's really easy to miss that little factor. Uh, as we'll as we'll lean into probably in our next podcast. There's mm. the the disciples are involved in in the second half of of Mark chapter five, and and in and yeah. deliberately so. But but in this one, they are incredibly absent. From this story, and <laughs> and of course, it, it's it's for all of us to remember. This for them is also a learning experience. They are literally seeing things they've never seen before in some cases, and they're certainly mm. seeing Jesus deal with it in a way they've never seen dealt with before. So, so mm. we should give these lovely young followers of Jesus. We should give them uh, a bit of room and a bit of a bit of slack on this one because I, mm. I I think there are moments in the ministry and life of Jesus when he seems to move into overdrive. He seems to go into something that's really quite dynamic and powerful. And and the these disciples around him, I think in a lot of cases are catching up and they're just trying to get their head around what on earth is going on. And and so I, I I think that's an encouragement to us all as followers of Jesus. There are moments when when we are taken by surprise. And also if we're honest, there are moments when we do want to step back. We do want to step away. Mm -hmm. We are a little bit intimidated by stuff that's going on around us. And so we would rather someone else handle this. And uh, and Jesus absolutely steps forward and 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 takes as it were, control of this situation in a in a fairly significant and authoritative way. It's very powerful. There's a little bit of me what wonders if there's a bit of the, the contrast happening in the story there as well. So the fact that Jesus seems to be alone, despite the fact he got off the boat with some disciples, almost mm. increases the contrast of the story because it's a face-off between Jesus alone and a legion of demons. So at one level it's a 1v1. It's this it's this man with the chains screaming from the from the tombs versus Jesus. But then as you dig into the story, as you say you notice, well, wait a minute, Jesus is alone without his disciples it appears. And and secondly, this man when we spend a bit of time with him 
seems to have the strength of thousands of of demonic forces that are giving him this sort of supernatural ability to to essentially be uncontrolled. Yeah, beautiful observation, David. I love that. I love that. And and, and whether that's deliberate from Mark or or one of those gorgeous god incidences in the sort of story, you know, it's like, oh, that is not a beautiful little sort of nuance, whether that's deliberate or not. But but you do get this stark moment of face off. You've got uh, yes. a fairly significant spiritual challenge for Jesus here as he steps forward and engages uh, with this man. And 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 you do get the sense of Wow, anything could happen here as we as we read the story. So it is it is very dramatic. It's I I think again reading it out loud gives the sense of the drama. And when you're prepared to slow that story down, you are you are aware of how dramatic this would be for his disciples, for the for the Gentiles looking after the pigs, for the whole thing that's going on here. And of course, right in the center of it, it's Jesus and this man, this nameless man. We we don't know his actual name, which is a a striking thing. But but Jesus engages with him. Beautiful. Beautiful. What's what's interesting, John, is the the language description. So if you follow verse two, uh, three, four, and then five, you get this very, very graphic dis- description of what's of of what we're dealing with in this in this particular mm. story. Um, but interesting that it starts with a term that that feels slightly underplayed to us. So if I said to you, let me, like a lot of Bibles, they had this, uh, Jesus heals the, the Gerasene demoniac, right? Or, or something like this. Uh, we're going to say Gerasene in, in this episode. Some people would pronounce it Gerasene. These are the things that, let's leave that to another group of people to discuss, which is the right way <laughs> to pronounce this. <laughs> but But if you actually read the text itself, a man with a spirit of impurity that's mm. that or or perhaps an unclean spirit now i think i i'm just going to say here i think the way to potentially translate that word is impure but largely because of how mark's telling us this story across the next chapter because we're going to f- f- encounter more religious and ritual impurity in the coming in the mm. coming verses mm. but at the same time i think that <laughs> As far as trailers go for the coming verses, a man with <laughs> with ritual impurity or a man with a with a spirit of impurity sorry the very it escalates quickly that almost mm. sounds like oh what is a spirit of impurity and the next thing you've got tombs and chains and <laughs> the, the the sort of all of this kind of very vast destructive language mm. this this description of this man as well, I mean, as 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 tormented by these other powers, aren't they? And, and definitely, mm. it seems like Mark's trying to describe to you. He lived amongst the tombs. Now, this you see this in a lot of Jewish literature that this is where people who are in the Jewish literature they, they would talk about a contemporary Jewish literature around about the time of mm. Jesus. You see the language of, well, that's where people who are out of their mind go and hang out. Right. Mm. And even though Mark doesn't say that the man is out of his mind, it is worth noting that after the the, the, the story, the healing or the exorcism happens, you notice that he does say, oh, the man is now in his right mind. Yeah, so you've got this, this very graphic image of, of people hanging out in, in, in tombs being very unstable. But then, then Mark adds to that. No one could restrain him, mm. not even with a chain. So they've tried, right? They've tried to chain this man up. But whenever they've chained him, he's just wrenched it apart and the shackles mm. have broke in pieces. Now, now this could this could sound slightly wrong and abusive at some level. Like, oh my goodness, these people are chaining up this man who's in such a, a difficult scenario. But if you actually jump ahead just to the end of verse five, you realize that that he is he is cutting himself. The mm. net result of this impure spirit or this this oppression that he's covered is causing immense bodily harm to the man. So, there, so it's also possible that the, the, the attempt to subdue this man is for his own benefit. Like well, this man is hurting himself. We have to somehow protect him. And then just at the end of verse four, I love these little moments in Mark where Mark goes, and no one had the yes. strength to subdue him. <laughs> Beautiful. And Beautiful. then and then enter stage right. Yes. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. 
it, it's a beautiful contrast. And of course, <laughs> we, we've we leaned into some of the stuff in Mark 4 in our parable series. And it, I think po- moving from Mark 4 into Mark 5 really exaggerates and illuminates that contrast even more mm-hmm. of the death sense, the uncontrolled chaos of the mm. demonic world, this impure uncleanness that these demons have brought on this man, contrasted mm. to the to the vitality and life of the kingdom of God that Jesus has touched on in in parables like the sower and and the mustard seed. And of course, what I love there, David, you've picked that up just beautifully at the end of verse four. There is a gorgeous contrast. End of verse four, chapter five with the end of chapter four. So when Jesus calms the storm, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Verse 40, do you still have no faith? And it says this, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So so we're stepping out of a storm where wind and waves have obeyed him. The first thing we're confronted with is the chaos of, the destruction, the antithesis of this life of the kingdom of God that Jesus has been presenting mm-hmm. through these magnificent parables. Uh, and climactically, we're told, oh, and by the way, uh, no one could subdue him. Having just been told by Mark that Jesus subdued, <laughs> he calmed the winds and the waves. And and I love that, again, to our, to our listeners it's leaning into sometimes the gorgeous connectedness of the text and not mm. just don't just jump off the edge of a chapter and then like forget where you've just been and then jump into a new chapter. Sometimes mm. the writer literally is carrying a, a gorgeous golden thread or a nuance from one story into another story. And mm. if you read end of four into five, you cannot miss this life death sort of contrast and this yes. subdues the wind and the waves oh and by the way no one can subdue him i, I just love mm-hmm. that isn't that gorgeous it just yes. it just grabs you and so you're you, you know that even though if we were reading mark 5 for the first time oh what's gonna happen if we were hearing this yeah. read to us what's about to happen if we've gone from four into five we're going hold on a minute the one who just calmed the wind and the waves is now mm-hmm. in front of someone who cannot be subdued oh Oh, yeah. is that a clue? Is is that some? <laughs> so he's he's gone from subduing nature, mm. and now he's being challenged by spiritual forces in terms of his yeah. authority and power. I, I I love I love that nuance it carries through there, David. And it and as you pick it up there, no one was able to subdue him. I think that's beautiful. And you get this sort of sense in the, again in the surrounding kind of literature and, and, and beliefs of Jesus's time that the evil forces are malevolent. They are setting themselves in opposition to God. So you've got Jesus, the Lord of nature, even the winds and the waves. And now you're going to come into, oh, well, what about Jesus and the malevolent forces? What about Jesus in, in, in this sort of context? Now, and what's interesting, of course, is Mark has been hinting to you about about this. So if you go right the way back to the beginning of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter one, Jesus, one of his first things that happens to him in his ministry after his baptism is this encounter with this oppressed man in, in a in a synagogue context. And now interestingly, this man there asks the same question of Jesus in Mark one twenty four as this as this legion asked Jesus here in verse seven like like the literal Greek is what what is there between us what to you and me what have what have you got to do with me and now this is a beautiful insight I think into the sort of sense of the of the the kind of demonic forces and how they were understood in the time of Jesus. Like, what have we got in common? What have we got to to do in this? It's very, very harsh language. You and me are significantly different. In fact, what's Mm. interesting is, uh, whereas at several points through the Gospels, you'll see the demons ask Jesus this question, what is there between us, Jesus? The only time you ever see Jesus ask this question is actually in John's Gospel when he asks it to his to his mom, right? When she says, you need to do something about there being no wine. And Jesus and Jesus is like, well, wait a minute. 
what have we got in common going on here? So it's, and in John, that phrase really contrasts the timeline of God with the timeline of humanity. But here in Mark, this question is always posing out hugely significant contrast between the world of the demons and the world the world Mm. of Jesus. But then what's interesting is at the end of that story uh, in Mark chapter 1, you get to verse 32 and 34, and Mark just throws out this little report about Jesus that says that Jesus goes through places and he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and casting out demons. And the way that the grammar of that little verse works is really beautiful because it sort of, Mark, implies that the kingdom of God and the demons, they can't share space. They can't Mm. be in the same location together. Mm. So from the very beginning of Mark's gospel, you've got this sense that when Jesus enters the place of impure spirits, something's going to have to happen because the two, it's the oil and water. They don't, they don't share space. They don't, they don't mix well together, which, which I think is quite, is quite exciting actually, the way that Mark set this up. Nature, now let's have a big contrast between not one, but thousands of demons. (laughs) Yeah. No, beautiful. And isn't it gorgeous as well, David, there just following your, your thread of just uh, seeing something beautiful again in Mark Mm 1 is that, all of those references would be in Mark 1 largely in a sort of a Jewish context. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that that Mark 1 story uh, actually happens in the context of a synagogue, which is, which is quite striking. Yes. And the implication following that towards the end of chapter 1 of Mark is that Jesus is ministering in sort of largely Jewish territory. And here he is now crossing mm-hmm. into Gentile territory. And it's like, and of course, some of our, some of our listeners may may uh, ha- have an understanding of this nuance. But there there was in the ancient Near East this sort of a territorial view of power, of God is the God of this region, or this people doesn't just mean a, a group, but but a sort of a geographic identity. And, mm-hmm. and you've got there Jesus in, in a very much Jewish context in Mark 1, showing mm-hmm. that he is master and Lord here. And the impact mm-hmm. that that makes, they, they, in a Jewish worldview, they, they they even say he he teaches as one who had authority. They're they're, they're shocked. What is this? They say new teaching mm-hmm. and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. <laughs> so in a Jewish world, he establishes that authority. Now in Mark five, it's as if it's as if he's putting a marker down, even in mm. Gentile authority, and showing. That God's authority can cross borders. God's authority can cross boundaries. God's authority mm. is not hindered by geography or by race. I, I think it's a lovely, if you connect yeah. one and five together, I think it's a nice wee extra thread there. So, so you're seeing a sort of expanding influence that Mark's kind of re- pulling back the curtain and showing you. Because like I'm noticing Mark 139, and he went throughout Galilee, so it's a very, very Jewish ministry, a uh, very localized Jewish ministry. He went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in synagogues and casting out demons. So you've got this, if, if, uh, and I love what you're saying here, this idea that, oh, look at this little local ministry, and there's a, bit of, there's a bit of casting out demons going on, and there's proclaiming of the message. And then you get this ministry growing, and now it's like, and now, wait a minute, okay, it's now taking on nature, and now it's taking on what we see Jesus doing locally in Galilee in synagogues, he's now doing in general. Gentile territory amongst the mm. tombs, uh, and of mm. course, as you say, the pigs. The pigs work as a good marker of. <laughs> we're definitely not <laughs> yeah. in Jewish territory right now, <laughs> for sure, for <laughs> sure. No, I, I do think that's a lovely little because the the other gospel writers, Matthew, very much leans into the idea of Jesus giving priority to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, mm. and rightly so. And there is a trajectory there. Luke is absolutely passionate for the margins. And I love Mark here just gluing the two ideas really nicely together without, it's really Mm. easy to miss that. It's, and it's, it's only when, again, you're reading the text in a bit of a big flow, you go, oh, okay. Mm. He's, he's popped from a Jewish context into a Gentile one, but he's doing the same 
sort of stuff mm. and I love that. And so talking about those contrasts then, I want to talk very briefly about what seems like a marginal anticlimax in the, in this story, which but a beautiful anticlimax. So I, like I'm noticing around about verses two and three, and you see this particularly strongly in the original language, but it's there for us as well, is this kind of, this compounding of negatives that mm. stress quite strongly that this man is out of control. So he, he is, he's no longer, he, no one, not even, they, they, they can't restrain him. They can't chain him up. The, no one's strong enough. There's this, this strong sort of building of this is a bad situation that we can't, that we can't fix. And then, and there might be, then there's some things that I, we should want to say about the interim verses, but just notice this while we're talking about these contrasts <laughs> the the man's howling and bruising he sees jesus from a distance and he runs mm. and bows down before him right Amazing. so so mark doesn't hold you in a lot of suspense as to how the story is going to go so it's like well how does jesus work within jewish context and jewish synagogues well he comes in with the message of the kingdom demons are cast out demons can't share that space jesus is able to control the wind and the waves this is things and now this big setup this uncontrollable man which we find out shortly is is being controlled by thousands of demons and it's a clash between it's it's like you've paid your you've paid your money to sit down and watch the championship fight in the boxing ring and you've stayed up till 1 a.m. because it's 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 being fought at the other side of the world <laughs> and, and you've got your your popcorn and all of your friends have gathered round and the fight starts and and it's over within seconds <laughs> that that he that, that this man comes and he bows down now some some translations have have he fell down and uh, fell at Jesus feet it's quite interesting actually that throughout chapter 5 you have yeah. the this man falling you have uh, Jairus falling at Jesus' feet, and you also have the woman falling at Jesus' feet. But Beautiful. it's just it is, worth it noting. Mm. The only thing that's subtly different is that mm. that when Jairus and the woman fall, it, the, the language is literally they fell at Jesus' feet. But when this man comes to Jesus, what he does, Mark describes as proskuneo, the Greek word Beautiful. proskuneo, which means worship. So this yeah. is not just a collapse of thing. He actually is drawn not simply to admit defeat, but this man oppressed by demons now worships Jesus. I think there's something there. <laughs> I do. I, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful pick up there, David, because uh, that stuff is so easily missed in our into English translations, because you read those three phrases that all look very similar, falling at the feet of, and we go, oh yeah, well, it's just the same thing, but there is that beautiful difference, of course, and, and literally translated, of course, the word is literally towards to kiss. I mean, mm. it is quite a powerful sort of imagery behind yes. what's going on here. There is, there's something within the man that is responding to the presence of Jesus. And of course, then we we end up going into a very interesting conversation, which seems to jump between <laughs> sort of the man and the demons and the singular and the plural, and it's all sort of bouncing <laughs> around there. But but I think, so, so the, the way I would want to read this is that I think we see a man here to even in the, in the, the darkness of his experience, he is seeing enough light in Jesus that he physically maneuvers himself. So if mm. that so 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 that's go back to this idea that you've already picked up on, which I love, this idea that Mark is setting up this scenario that that Jesus, the presence of God and the presence of the demonic can't share the same space. Mm. So then the man moving towards Jesus, that that can't be the demons doing that. The, the <laughs> demons in their conversation with Jesus are trying to get away from Jesus. In fact, the, the, their sort of nuclear option is, okay, dump us in the pigs, but just don't send us out of the area, but you can dump us in the pigs. Because when they get into the pigs, they can get away from Jesus, which of course they try yeah. to do. Here's the man running to Jesus. Now, the only way I can square that circle, if demons <clears throat> and Jesus can't occupy the same space or certainly if demons don't want to occupy the same space as Jesus, then 
then it's not the demons moving towards Jesus. It's the man. And mm-hmm. even in his possessed, broken, desperate, mm-hmm. devastating context, he is physically moving. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the text seems to suggest that these demons just cause this man to cut himself and hurt himself and do all sorts of terrible mm. things to himself. The impression you're given is they overpower him. They make him do what he doesn't want to do. But here's the man, it seems to me, David, is doing mm. something that they don't want to do. He is literally, yeah. it's like it's like he sees a light in the darkness and he's, I've got to get to that light, even if it kills yes. me to do it. And, and, I, and I think that's, I think Mark's use of proscuneo is, is leaning into that. I, I and mm. and I think if you grab the idea, it's it's too much to say, maybe worship in the sense that we understand, but I think it is enough to say, here's a man, he sees something mm. and he moves towards Jesus in spite of the demons mm-hmm. inside him. He's desperate yeah. to get to Jesus. So then you get this this conversation, which is quite which is quite something. What do you have to do with me? Jesus, mm. son of the most high God. So there's this, this, now, this is quite interesting here because you get this, this now appears to be the, the, the demons are now talking, right? Have you come to torment us? Now, a couple of things that are interesting in here, John, that I'd love to pick up on. Uh, one, just that, that perception of torment. There's some irony in that. You know, they have been, they have been destroying mm-hmm. this man and tormenting mm-hmm. this man. And their first question to Jesus, to almost is, well, have, have you come to do the same to us? There's something very classically biblical about that, that the demons assume that God has the same agenda as they have. You see this in the temptations of Jesus early on in his right. ministry, where, where the, the Satan offers Jesus all of these powers, assuming that Jesus is essentially on the same journey as he is. And this is a common problem of evil in the Bible that, and it's actually a common problem of evil in the world, isn't it? That, that, that Christianity uh, that follows Jesus can quickly be perceived to have the same agenda, mm-hmm. but just to do the same thing slightly differently. And, and, one, and sometimes the church, I feel, gets lost in that, assuming that Oh, we're just trying to do the same thing for a different reason. And the constant ministry of Jesus is, no, he's trying to do a different thing. <laughs> he's trying mm, to do things right. differently. The way, the way the ministry of Jesus reads success, like a very easy, let me, let me pick on some low-hanging fruit for a second, but the way that, that society judges success has often become the way that church chooses to judge success. If a church is bigger, richer, and fancier, that clearly is a better church than a church that's smaller, poorer, and and not so fancy. And you've accidentally stepped over into assuming that the kingdom is motivated in exactly the same way way as wider society. You see this again here. Well, you must be here to, we torment people all the time. So you must be here now to torment us. It's a very interesting thing. But there's also a little little potential uh, interesting hint back in the Old Testament, where in Zechariah 13, you get this sort of prophetic look, uh, Zechariah 13, 2, you get this sort of prophetic look to the day of the Lord and what will happen. Mm. And the Lord says, on that day, I'll cut off the names of the idols from the land. And you get a lot of idol demonic connection in, 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 in Jewish thinking at that point. So they'll be remembered no more. And I will also remove from the land the prophets and the, the ruach of impurity, the spirit of impurity. So is it possible that you've got this kind of background of of, of of knowledge within this context, that if if the, the demons have identified who Jesus is, is there a sense of the math of the equation is, wait a minute, if he's here, <laughs> that means that we're not going to be here very soon. Absolutely. And of course, there's a beautiful irony that <clears throat> maybe before a lot of humans start to spot who Jesus is, within especially the marking context it's the demons that are spotting it uh, and actually in a weird way they're sort of this is going to sound perverse please don't hear what i'm not saying in a weird way they're sort of evangelizing for him yes. so so they are declaring who he is i mean even in the mark one situation he literally tells him to shut up 
Yeah. Uh, he tells him, "Be quiet. I don't. I don't want you to say this." So, oh, the Greek in that like, context, he actually Jesus says to him, "Be muzzled," which I always think is yeah. brilliant. He actually, the, the, it often gets translated as "be quieter," but the Greek is "be muzzled," like, muzzled. which is interesting. Yeah. How Jesus. There's maybe something to talk about one day about how Jesus talks to demons. He, he shuts them down. He doesn't give them space to keep tormenting people. Mm. Mm. And of course, if if you link something like Zechariah into Mark, then we are given mm. a very clear understanding of what this kingdom is starting to look like, what yeah. the agenda is, what Jesus is here really to do, what what he's mm. here to cut off or cut away and and the, the demonic forces clearly understand something's on and therefore are are begging as it were for mercy before this mm-hmm. thing gets going so so it, i i think it does it it leans into the sort of wider agenda of an understanding of the kingdom and the fact that in the early part of mark it's the demons that are actually giving us the big clues as to who mm-hmm. Jesus is and what he's here to do. So I think it's a beautiful idea. And of course, the irony, it's okay for us to torment him, but you don't torment us. Don't do not do to <laughs> us what we've done to him. I mean, isn't it? They, they've, they've, they've destroyed this man within an inch of his life, but, but don't torture us. And of course, Jesus, his agenda is not in the torturing of the demonic, but his agenda is in the liberation of humanity. And, and he doesn't, it seems to me Jesus doesn't go out of his way to hunt the demonic, but mm. it but it seems to me that in doing the kingdom, he collides with the demonic constantly, and and I think again it's another little nuance within the text. Even as you were saying that, John, it just it struck me that the golden rule: do to others as you would have them do to you. You get this implied opposite of how evil works. So what is the way of God? One of the things that Jesus says is we well, do to others as you would as you would have them do to you. And then here you have the forces of evil saying, don't do to us what we've yeah. been doing to everybody else. I mean, yeah. uh, that's not explicitly present in the text for sure, but no. it just strikes me as an interesting no. uh, potential connection the there. At, yeah, yeah. And I love what you're saying, um, about this identification of Jesus. It's something that I have long enjoyed in the way Mark structures his gospel, that where he he tells you in verse one, this is the good news about Jesus <laughs> Christ, the Son of God. But then the identity of Jesus then is a very strange question in Mark's gospel. Yes. And, and ironically enough, as you said uh, completely correctly, it's just demons that spot who he is, and no, mm. no human actually spots this. And, and what's really ironic is there's only one human in all of Mark's gospel that identifies Jesus as the Son of God. When, when you know, say, when I say only one human, I mean one human not speaking by demonic powers, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. it's the Roman centurion. In, in in Mark chapter fifteen verse thirty nine, this this centurion that goes, surely this man was the son of God. And now there's something really ironic there that it's a Roman centurion who is in the process of of guarding Jesus' execution that notices it. So mm. there is a little arc to think about there about how Jesus relates to power even as well. You know that that this demon runs down the hill and falls at Jesus's feet, and, he, and and all that Jesus has said at this point is just come out of him. So demons, the forces of evil, recognize Jesus. Humans are a little uncertain, and it's something. There's something beautiful about the fact that the only time in Mark's gospel, that, or the first time that a human recognizes Jesus as the Son of God, is as he dies. And it's again, I feel like it's this inverting of structures of power that, that, that you would assume that people would recognize him as son of God when he feeds the 5,000, when he walks on water, when he, when he calms the storm, when he raises the dead, when he heals the blind. But none of that, in no point in Mark's gospel, do people draw that connection. But it was when he dies that, people, that the man goes, oh, surely this is the son of God. And I think Mark's intentionally help drawing us towards those stories to make that point that if you're going to understand Jesus, remember what we talked about an earlier episode where Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It's when he describes who he is. It's that journey of the cross that takes us to the understanding of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, t- totally. I, I'm, and it's, it is a beautiful idea that nature recognizes him, the demonic recognizes him, 
people are a little bit slower to recognize him. And yet, Mm. even within the gospel account, sometimes it's Gentiles who are recognizing him before Mm. his own people. John, of course, picks this up very, very starkly. John said he came to his own and they didn't recognize him. Now, Mm. now I know that that sounds like a a, a sort of totally inclusive term, but of course, John, John is saying that in the general sense. That, mm. that he was not recognized, even though many did recognize him personally. So I, I do, I think that tension, I, I think it's one of the dangers we have when we read back into the Gospels. We just assume people are getting this stuff. My goodness, mm. if this was happening in my street, we would just get this. But it takes people a while to get this. And we move towards an understanding of who Jesus is, especially in Mark's Gospel. And so then so then you get this conversation around the person's name. Uh, this seems to be interesting, that, that there is a view in the ancient world that owning that owning the name of something gives you a level of authority over it. You see that right the way back even with Moses' encounter with God at the, the burning bush. There's this sense of, oh, well, but what's your name? So name gives authority. So there's some sense that I think it's important for the reader to see that Jesus, son of the most high God, is a little bit of a power play by the demon as well. Mm. Oh, I know mm. your name. So, but Jesus' mm. response then is to say, well, you've now, you've got to tell me your name, to mm. which the, the demon has to cede to Jesus in that. It's interesting that the demon can't resist Jesus. He, yeah. And you get this, well, my name is Legion, for we are for we are many. So legions sure. somewhere between three and 6,000 soldiers yeah. in, in yeah. those days. Yeah. Before we even dive even further into that, David, I think there's a, a, a lovely little allusion in verse 7 itself. The demons say, What to me and to you, Jesus, mm-hmm. Son of God, the Most High, I adjure you. Mm. I adjure you by God not to torment me. Now, that's sort of very literal language. Most of our translations sort of don't have that. So in my NIV, it sort of says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High? Swear to God that you won't torture me. And I think that takes us slightly in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So the the language of a jeweler is, Mm. especially in the casting out of demons, would have been language known in that day, for example, by the religious yes. community, I adjure you by the name of Adonai, uh, come out, I bind you. So, so actually the casting out of a demon would probably involve the term or phraseology, I adjure you by God most high, I adjure you by Adonai mm. Elohim, that, that you've got to come out and listen. Mm. So isn't it ironic then that they try to play the adjure card mm. on Jesus? They So they're, they're nice. actually trying to, play a game here now I, 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 that's probably far too frivolous language but they're they're i'm leaning into your power play stuff i think there's a power play tucked in this verse where the demons are going i adjure you by god now now of course if if we're going with this idea that the demons have already spotted who jesus is then they know there is as it were in in and through the incarnation, there's some mm. sort of authority structure here. Jesus, though God, is walking in submission to his father. And it's yeah. almost as if they're trying to trump him by appealing to an authority structure above him. I mm. adjure you by God. Now, isn't mm. that fascinating? Yeah. It's a little bit, it's a bit cheeky. Like it's a bit, in England, we would say it's a bit brass neck, isn't it? It's like, it's like you are really absolutely pushing it there. But, but doesn't it then lean into the idea we do have a genuine power struggle going yeah. on here? Because Jesus has, has told them to come out. Now they're adjuring him. Mm. Same language in reverse. And, so and I, again, his I, name. I, yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. It's really fascinating, isn't it? So you've almost got so, the sense from, from your, what you're saying there that, that the demons are using the first century Jewish playbook on how to cast out demons against Jesus. We know indeed. your name, and we're now yeah. going to use exorcism language to demand that you do some things. Exactly. That's quite a, that's quite an insight. It's, it's, I, I think it's too good to miss. I think it's there. I think it's easy for us to miss, of course, in the 21st century. Why would we know that? But when you <laughs> dig into the language and practices of the first century, that really does hang there. And of course, what's fascinating is in, in Mark 5, verse 8, it, it just says, he was saying to him, 
you come forth unclean spirit mm. out of the man. Now, really fascinating that that Jesus seems to be acting in his own authority. And at this stage, mm. he's not even doing the adjure bit. So again, no. there's another little beautiful nuance that what they're normally expecting is to be adjured. I adjure you mm-hmm. by the name of Adonai, come out. And here's Jesus just going, no, no, come out. Out you come. Let's go. Yes, and he doesn't even so, know their name. <laughs> I, 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 at this stage, absolutely. It's yeah. it, it's this it's this Brilliant. interesting dance that seems to be going on, which just looks like a story to us. But I think there's something very powerful because we're we're trying to lean in not just what Jesus did. We're trying to lean into what's the message in here. What's going on? Mm. Jesus doesn't do anything randomly. So this this man has been exercised of these demons, but but it's. There's, there's something else going on here. And mm. this is one of the most explicit encounters that Jesus has with demonic force in terms of conversation, which has got to be a wee bit of a clue for us, I think. Yeah, I really, really like th- that insight. It, it just adds to the whole sort of picture of the scene, doesn't it? It's quite excellent. And now some, some writers over the years have kind of wondered whether there's something interesting going on with the language of legion. There's definitely Mark is contrasting Jesus potentially as as some alternative to the Roman Caesar. The, the mm-hmm. Caesar was known as the son of God and Mark is mm-hmm. presenting, no, I'm here to tell you about Jesus, the son of God, which therefore is why it might be interesting that, that, that it's a Roman centurion that mm-hmm. declares. So there might be an emphatic contrast. It's not surely this was the son of God. It's actually surely this is the son of God, yeah. not him. Uh, so then you've got this potential little thing that, that Mark likes this story here because the, because there's we're, we're in Greco-Roman context now. We're outside of Israel. So the, 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 the demon has a Greek name and the name happens to be, <laughs> you know, ha- happens to be the name of, of, a, yeah. of, of a Roman military outfit in that sense. Yeah. There's, so there's, again, this potentially just a subtle yeah. underlying anti-powers thing going on here. I wouldn't want to go too far on it. I love a lot of people have made a lot of the Jesus versus Rome stuff to the extent that some writers even give you the impression that's all that's going on in the Bible. But I can't help but think there is a very subtle Jesus and the powers addition mm. because of this language here of, of, mm. of how is Jesus. The Jesus who will die on a Roman cross is, is facing some of these things earlier mm. in his ministry. That's beautiful. And, and certainly it's... It's worth noticing, isn't it? It's like, that is a very unusual word. Like, of all the mm. words that the demons could have called themselves, why that yes. word? So yeah. so I think when a word stands out like that, you go, oh, oh that's interesting. And, and certainly, once you dig into the, the world of Jesus, the Roman context of Jesus, at the very least, it flags a moment of pause and think about is there something else going on here and i i wouldn't push back against that at all i think that's a beautiful nuance and of course again what's gorgeous that the gospel writers never so show jesus being anti-roman in a purely sort of racial or yeah. political way that that if he does set himself up against rome it's purely in terms of the kingdom of god it's never in terms yes. of right I'm here to overthrow Rome, although ultimately mm. the kingdom of God does outlive Rome, <laughs> yes. which is magnificent. But but it's not his agenda. He's he's not yes. trying to score any points against Pilate or any other authorities. But totally. a gorgeous little nuance there, beautiful. I love that, David. Very nice. And so so then so you get this this scene, just the the complete manic sort of sense of the scene. The spirits come out. They enter the pigs. <laughs> they rush down and, and jump and are drowned in the sea. It's it's quite... I, there's a part of me, John, I'm not even really sure what to say about this part of yeah. the scene other than it's, it's just... It's, <laughs> it's just quite... It, the only thing I can sort of kind of put together is that there's something going on here again. One since we've talked about the powers and, and, and this contrasting sense of the powers. And then you get Jesus allowing them to go into these pigs mm. and and just the grandness of this. Now we actually see 
the, the Jesus has been very understated throughout all of this. The man is screaming at the top of his voice. Jesus is talking to him. They're trying to use exorcism language against Jesus. Jesus is just operating calmly in his own power. And then you just get this little moment of insight. In contrast, perhaps, with the calming of the winds and the waves, you get, oh, Jesus actually can move the demons from this man elsewhere and, and charge off into the sea. I, I, I do... Do you see what I'm kind of scratching at a little bit there? Absolutely. I, I, I've I, always found this a little bit difficult from understanding the complete trauma to the mm. economy of whoever owned the pigs. Yes. I, I mean, if we ignore that, we do, we do ignore a pretty awkward moment in this story. Yes. So we've got the glory of the redemption and transformation of this man. I mean, he is transformed, but at the cost of someone's livelihood. In some way, now I, I, I know people may not appreciate this, but like two thirds that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money yes. that has just rushed down the hill. I remember a friend of mine, he used to minister in Donegal, Alan Graham, who's now a missionary in Zimbabwe. And uh, our church supported him, and we went round the schools of Donegal, rural Donegal, to do uh child evangelism in the schools. Fantastic mm-hmm. time! And Alan was teaching the story of the two sons, the lost son, or of course for him, it was the, the prodigal. And he, he said, he said, he said that, that the prodigal's lying with these pigs and it, it wants to eat the pods of the pigs. And, and, and Alan's trying to show this terrible scene with these pigs. And he said, wouldn't it be awful to be surrounded by pigs? And honestly, David, that what happened next was glorious. We <laughs> boy put his hand up and, and Alan says, yes, son, what is it? He says, Mr. Graham, he says, Mr. Graham, there's great money in pigs, he says. There's great money in pigs. <laughs> and, and I thought, yeah, only a kid in the rural community would get that. <laughs> yes. Me and you, yeah. the only time we think about pig is when it's on our plate. If we eat pig, yes. many, many of our yes. listeners won't touch it. But, but, but you know, that's the only time we think about pig. But, but yes. this is serious money. So, yes. <laughs> it 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 is a hard one. Why does Jesus permit them to go into the pigs and destroy or at least impact someone's livelihood? Is it mm. simply to create this massive moment of drama that then actually ironically opens up the pathway for the gospel mm. in that region, which of course we know from the trajectory of the end of this story into Mark 6. Uh, I mean, amazing things clearly start to happen in the Decapolis in the ten cities mm. because of this, and it almost takes this shocking moment to jolt this community. And of course, there is there is nothing. McGranny would have said it's the threat of execution concentrates the mind. But there's nothing that's going to get your <laughs> attention more than than economic disturbance uh, in your region. Mm. And it seems that actually, though there was an initial backlash, it does seem to create the way for the gospel. But it's a hard one. Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the only other thing that I would add to it is that f- reading this story as, as, a, as a Jewish messiah, you have a mm. man who has a, an impure spirit. And of course, pigs are impure animals. Now, and I get that we're not in Israel at this point, but... If you're if you're reading this from a Jewish point of view, this might actually almost make sense that the oh, the totally. impure spirit attaches itself to the impure animal, and both are destroyed. So yeah. there's a potentially a symbolic way of reading this, which is definitely the visual destruction mm. of impurity at a mm. grand scale, almost yeah. a preceding preceding God's grand destruction of evil which is coming on the cross I mean, I mean that mm-hmm. but like you say that doesn't that doesn't take away from the the poor people who who lost all of their pigs and therefore come back quite rightly and say to Jesus maybe Get maybe lost. you could go somewhere else <laughs> Jesus <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get lost. yeah absolutely it's a begging language isn't it it's mm. it's at the same sort of Verocity that that the demons beg to be let go into the mm. into the pigs. They're sort of saying to Jesus by the end of this story, "Leave us, get out of, leave our region." I think there's a beautiful little play on the sort of imagery of begging. You know, the demons beg, the man who's who's 
released from the demons. He begs. The people sort of beg. I mean, there's a beautiful, beautiful language sort of knocking around in this. And, mm. and I do love that sort of juxtaposition there in, in all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's incredible. Incredible. So, so like, verse 15, they, they come to Jesus <laughs> so, so somebody, the, the, the poor swine herds, they're like, oh my goodness. So they head off to the city to tell everybody what's going on. The people now come, they find out that this is actually right. Our pigs are gone. And they see Jesus and the demoniac. It's fascinating. This is the first time the man is called a demoniac in the text. And actually, it's at the point the demon has been uh, evicted from him <laughs> they saw him sitting there and then you get this sitting the the, the, the again the greek is, is really quite punchy the way the greek does it he's sort of he's sitting clothed in his right mind it's a three category mm. sort of it's the three Beautiful. it's the complete reversal of him in in the when we met the man he mm-hmm. is he is roaming around the tombs mm. unrestrained now he's sitting he's slashed and cut and you get the sense that clearly he was not well dressed in this sort of sense and he was out of his mind and Jesus has completely reversed this that's beautiful beautiful and then again still not knowing what to call the man he now becomes the man who had had the legion <laughs> and then you get and and then they you get this line and they were afraid. <laughs> yeah. Now, maybe it's some of their fear. Oh, my goodness. If this man comes into our city, we're going to have no animals left anywhere. Is it just basic mm-hmm. economic fear? Uh, is it fear at we didn't think anybody could restrain this man? Mm-hmm. And not only has Jesus not restrained him, he has actually healed him Mm. so it's not that they come and jesus has got him in some good chains and jesus is saying you need these chains from the other side of the the sea that you can get in galilee but actually better than restraining the man jesus has 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 cured him it's quite absolutely beautiful and and i love that contrast in how he's introduced to how he now is Mm. and the reaction and again i think the reaction of the people in the decapolis is is a repeated sort of nuance in all of the gospel. Jesus does some stuff, and you just expect everybody to go, "Wow, that's amazing! We need mm. a bit more of that." That's that's have a bit, and yet so often when Jesus does stuff, either even in a Jewish context or a Gentile context, he gets an adverse reaction. Mm. So they they were afraid, and and I do sense. I mean, for me, I would lean into the idea he couldn't. You couldn't build your house on this explicitly, but I would lean into the idea of fear of, wow, hold on, something something way above our pay grade has just happened here. <laughs> we are seeing something that none of us have ever seen before. This man was completely wild, and now yes. look at him. And I think there's a general, a, a general fear comes on. And then, of course, in 17, uh, they began to beg him to depart. Same language as the demons who mm. begged to be sent into the region. So you, so, so is that a little nuance there, that sort of in the way that the demons are going, okay, we need to get out of your space. Mm. Now the people are saying, you need to get out of our space. We need you yeah. away from us. Get away from us. We're not ready for whatever this is. We're very impressed by what you've just done. But like <laughs> we are, we are totally not ready for whatever yeah. this is uh, and of course we know there will come a day when they will be ready mark mm. picks that up beautifully in chapter six and maybe this man is part of that story i'm fairly certain he is but at this moment they're begging jesus in mm. the same language of the demons get out of here uh, and i love yes. that contrast again this this is a passage of beautiful uh, contrasts and connections which we're seeing everywhere that mm. the demons can't stay in the same space as Jesus. Now the people don't want Jesus to stay in the same space as them. It's um, yeah, fascinating, fascinating reaction. And the whole, <laughs> the whole thing's quite funny, actually, at, at some level. Like the, the story, the story is beautiful, right? I, I I love this story. You said it right after you read it. The, the story's got a lot of scary elements to it, but it is a beautiful story. It's even, John. It's even beautiful that we see Jesus in what we now come to believe would be his standard miraculous ministry that he has 
he's the 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 individual has been separated from the group has been cast out has been marginalized and and Jesus isn't drawn first to the group but he's drawn first to this marginalized situation mm-hmm. so again we're seeing the same sort of patterns happening but but there's a humor even to the story if you actually just remember and I don't know. I just love reading the Bible in its way as to how it, it works sometimes. And we can get so intensely focused on stuff that we we forget sometimes the, the, just the little nuances of the story. So they've got in a boat. They've sailed through a storm. <laughs> Jesus has had to miraculously calm the storm, right? They got out of the boat. They met this man. They healed him. And now they're getting back in the boat to head back where they came from. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's almost a sense of, you know, and it, I think give the realism to the story at that level. Like yeah. this ministry yeah. has completely been halted. It's, it's like, let's go over there and do something. We cross the, we cross the sea at some great peril. And they, it... <laughs> I almost imagine this whole scene happens kind of close to the beach <laughs> where they then. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so then they come back down, jump on the boat, and they have to head away again. But actually, that becomes really important to me. You've just alluded to it, and I, it's one of my favorite bits of this story is they're getting back into the boat, and the man still hasn't got a name. So now he's just known as the man who had been possessed by a demon. <laughs> Talk about your past chasing you around, right? Uh, he now comes and notice. Just notice what's going on there in um, in verse 18 again, and look what he mm. does. He now yeah. begs again. Right? He begs. Uh, yeah. But this time, a different begging. This time, it's that, actually, I, I want to be with you, Jesus. And Jesus instead says to him, no, Jesus refused, right? Like, goodness me, he refused to, like, so this is so not what we would expect at this point in the story. If you mm-hmm. just try and read it, read it plainly. Jesus has come. Nobody likes him in this place. This man's realized Jesus really is quite something special. So the man says, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be with you, Jesus. And we would assume Jesus would say, absolutely, leave your past life behind, come follow me, because that's what we're saying. But instead, Jesus goes, no. He says, says, instead, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Mm. Now, (laughs) I'm cautious to say this here, John, right? Because both you and me have been strong proponents of biblical education and discipleship and ministry training for our whole lives. But Jesus sends this man off with no training whatsoever. All he has is a story. All the man has is a story that, oh yeah, I was I was the guy. I was the guy. We don't know what his name was. I was the guy that used to be possessed by a legion of demons. And I met yeah. Jesus, and now I'm not possessed by a legion of demons. Beautiful. What else do you know about him? He was merciful to me. <laughs> right? yeah. Um, yeah. And that's all he's got. That's all the that's man all has. And, and, and Jesus goes away. But the man, verse 20, he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis, the region of the 10 cities, this Gentile region, yes. how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Now, now, the thing is, so you've alluded to this. And so let's just jump to it really, really quickly, though, John, because it's just too much fun not to. So Jesus later on, so you, let's just turn over to Mark chapter 7 in our text for a mm-hmm. second. And, and around about verse 31, you get, so Jesus has now gone through a few other scenarios and, and, and healings and things like that. And then the text in verse 31 says this, Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. So this is the next mention of Decapolis. We don't, we've, we've, we've not sure what's gone on through there. And notice what happens next. The people, they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him, look at that word again, begged him to lay his hand on him. And I just love this sense, John, that the, the, the first time we see Jesus in the Decapolis, they're like, you need to go away from here. The second yeah. time we see Jesus in the Decapolis is people going, you got to help us because we know you can. And just taking Mark's text as Mark text mm. is given to us, the only connection, the only thing we know is that Jesus left this unnamed man in the Decapolis. And somewhere yeah. between visit one and visit two, the people <laughs> went from, you've got to get out of here to, we need your help. And, and I just love the idea that this untrained man who all he had was his authentic story <laughs> tells his authentic story and something changes 
in the region of the Ten Cities. I mean, it's, it's good it's, stuff, that, John, isn't it? It's too good. It's too good, David. It's it's gorgeous. It's brilliant. It's magnificent. And doesn't it show again, one of the things we leaned into in the parables was Jesus' supreme confidence in the seed, supreme confidence in the Word of God and what that does in people. And actually, there's a, there's a gorgeous little in-between bit between Mark 5 and Mark 7, David. There's a, the, you, the, you've referenced the explicit Decapolis, but it, actually at the end of Mark 6 as well, it's almost like it's it's a, an emphasis here. And it says at the end of Mark 6, when they'd crossed over and landed at the Gen- at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized him. Mm. Uh, that's interesting. And then at the end, it says, uh, end of the passage, it says, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. So so you, you've got... If our listeners can put all of this together, it is just magnificent. We've got we've got the begging of the demons, don't mm. touch us. You've got the begging of the man, help me. You've got now the man begging to go with Jesus and the people begging Jesus to leave. And now we've mm. got the kingdom of God spreading and they're begging him to stay and they're begging mm. him to heal. It's just it's just stunning. It's just stunning. Yeah. And and that runs as a beautiful little subtext there. That's definitely Mm. worth picking up on Jesus ministry into the Decapolis. And again, it it leans into this idea that Jesus wasn't just preoccupied with exclusively the lost sheep of the the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but Mm. was opening up a pathway for the Gentile world. And uh, and of course, Galilee of the Gentiles becomes Mm. the great platform for that, of which the Decapolis gets the benefit. Mm. It's beautiful. It is when you look at it and put all those pieces together and kind of string them all, all all in line. It is just a phenomenal little text that we've just looked at today that that just sort of pushes into the power of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, and just the the story of, of what it's like to encounter that that Jesus. Incredible. And for me, David, there's a lovely little. Just a lovely little finish, like in, in Mark 5, and I just spotted, we, we've talked about the fact that the people were afraid. In verse 16, it says, they, they, when they saw the man sitting in his right mind, they were afraid. And then at the end, in verse 20, as he goes about, they marveled, they were amazed. And, yeah. and what, what a beautiful thing that people could go from being afraid of something that they don't understand to then marvel at something. And ultimately, I think Jesus wants to take the world from fear uh, about him or fear about themselves and lead them to a place where they marvel, where they wonder. And and again, I think it's just a lovely little contrast there right at the end of our story, which just grabbed me as I was reflecting on it. Okay, that's it for today's episode thanks so much for listening we hope you enjoyed being with us if you want to get in touch with either of us about something that we said then don't forget you can reach out to us on podcast at twotext.com or by liking and following the two text podcast on facebook instagram twitter and youtube if you enjoyed the episode we'd love it if you left a review or a comment where you're listening from and if you really enjoyed this episode then why not share it with a friend don't forget that you can listen to all our podcasts at www.2texts.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. But that is it for this episode. We'll be back on Thursday with our second text for this week. But until then, goodbye.